Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Again, wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for uh, joining us for the August edition of our Clarity in a Time of Crisis webinar series. So uh, I think it's our actually our ninth edition. So uh, we started weekly and now we're running these on a monthly uh, update basis. We're bringing in critical lessons and insights from leading research and data partners and from uh, destinations and other critical projects all over the world. Um, we're, we're delighted to be joined today by, uh, again, not just two, but three real thought leaders in uh, tourism and destination marketing. First, let me introduce uh, a very old, very familiar, not old <laughs> uh, face, Amir Elon, President and CEO of Longwoods International and our wonderful partner in researching the impact of uh, COVID-19 on US travel. So Amir, are you still uh, hunkered down in Ohio? No, greetings from uh, beautiful White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, at the Greenbrier uh, Historic Resort here. Uh, my very first business trip uh, in the midst of the pandemic. So I'm, I'm very excited to be out of the house for a few days. <laughs> Wonderful, mate. So and another very familiar face, uh, John Lambeth joins us again. John is uh, president and CEO of Civitas Advisors, and uh, many of you will know we've been working with Civitas and Adam Sachs and the team at Tourism Economics on funding futures, looking at future options and opportunities for tourism and DMO funding. And uh, John's going to be sharing a quick update on some uh, major milestones in that project. Uh, John, whereabouts do we find you? Uh, I'm in beautiful Sacramento, California this morning, Chris. It's great to be here. We've, we've cooled off a bit. I think it's only going to be 90 today. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> positively wintry, mate, for uh, that part of California. Um, and another familiar face, anybody who is with us at uh, St. Louis at Destinations International Annual Convention in 2019 will uh, remember Mark Elwood. Mark is uh, editor at large at the Rob Report, uh, still, I think, contributing to Condé Nast Traveller uh, yeah. and a real thought leader um, in terms of uh, looking around the world and he's going to be discussing some of the latest trends in luxury travel so mark did uh uh whereabouts are you and did i get your introduction so, you know you always get my introduction right that's great but i have to apologize in advance if anyone's been watching the weather forecast as sort of tropical storm isaiah slaloms up the east coast it is overhead right now so if you hear thunder it isn't my stomach i have at lunch I apologize right now, it's sort of apocalyptic outside. I wish it were 90 degrees. So I apologize in advance if the weather misbehaves, it's not me. <laughs> Joining us through rain and winds. Um, thanks <laughs> very much, Mark. Fingers crossed. Okay, so um, we're gonna be uh, kicking it off with Amir to give us a quick update on the sentiment of American travelers, the impact of COVID-19. We're gonna take a special look at some of the health related questions we've been asking over recent weeks and have a quick outlook of um, the rest of the summer in terms of travel. We're gonna be posing a poll question to you on your outlook and your destination for the balance of 2020. Then we'll uh, catch up with John and the future funding DMO research project um, and the release of a discussion guide uh, later this week. And then we'll be joined by Mark to talk about the luxury travel market and the myriad of ways in which they are innovating and adapting to uh, the pandemic uh, and some of the lessons and takeaways that you'll be able to apply to your destination. Uh, thanks, as always, to our partners and friends at Destinations International at US Travel, uh, and a special shout out to US Travel for their support of the F Futures Funding Project, uh, Southeast Tourism Society and DMA West, all, of course, doing uh, wonderful work during the pandemic. Um, as always, we've got uh, a lot of resources, um, both the slide deck, a recording of this webinar will be available on our COVID-19 site, Clarity in a Time of Crisis, 
We've now launched a sister site to this, uh, Global All Stars, which has the content from our Global All Stars uh, webinar series that we ran at Destinations International Annual Convention and a range of case studies from around the world. And so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Amir for an update on the latest research. And um, Amir, take it away. Well, thank you, Chris, uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Great to be back. I'm going to get things moving here. And uh, oh, the slides are not moving. Uh, there we go. All right. So, wave 17 already. Can you believe it? We are already on the 17th wave of our travel sentiment study. Uh, we've been running since the very beginning of March when our country went into lockdown and uh, been tracking, uh, pulling uh, a thousand American travelers every couple of weeks. Uh, this latest data was just fielded last Wednesday and Thursday. It was just released this morning. So, we're one of the very first sets of eyes to see this data here today. So let's jump right into the numbers. And uh, I think the theme for this week's report is stabilization. And then we'll couple that with a little bit of frustration on the traveler side, uh, especially when it comes to health and safety. We'll talk about that near the end here. So 73% uh, of travelers planning to travel in the next six months will be changing their travel plans uh, uh, due to the pandemic. About 47% have reduced their travel plans in some form or fashion. About 41% are canceling their trip altogether. Uh, a little over a quarter are changing from flying uh, getaways to uh, drive market getaways. And you know, there's still a little bit of that uh, fall travel bookings that have been there for international travel. And uh, you know, with the EU reopening, we're putting the U.S. on the naughty list, and uh, um, and, and Canada and Mexico effectively uh, closed non-essential travel through, through at least the end of August. Folks are just kind of tired of delaying, and they're canceling those remaining trips and switching to domestic uh, travel. So as we look at the next uh, slide here, you can kind of, you kind of see the roller coaster uh, that that we've been through here. Um, from you know, kind of peaking in early April, 85% of travelers changing their plans, and then we got down to about 69%, and now we're back up to about 73. Um, uh, uh, there, been, again, just with the news of the surges and lockdown and coming out of lockdown and so forth, it's, it's the, you'll see the roller coaster pattern uh, quite a bit here. Looking at the next data here, uh, this is an encouraging sign. Uh, you can see back, uh, or you can see that. Uh, there's a great, there's a good delta here again, where the those the volume of people who've reduced their trips versus those who've canceled altogether um, is now in, in favor of those who've reducing their travel plans. Um, we saw this happening in late May, early June, and then the news of the continuing surge uh, has happened, and, uh, and and things kind of went back backwards. Um, we want people changing plans, not canceling plans, obviously, because if they're cha just changing plans, they're going. They're going to be moving. Maybe they're taking shorter getaways and so forth and, and uh, versus canceling altogether. So uh, some optimism there and hope it keeps trending back in the right direction. But again, the roller coaster pattern. Let's keep moving here. Um, we can see that a quarter of folks have been, have been changing uh, from, from flying to driving destinations. That's been a very consistent uh, uh, pattern over the last few months, and I expect that to continue for the uh, for at least the near term, near to midterm future. Uh, and then, of course, we've seen what's happening with the international market. As I, I talked about it uh, two weeks ago, you saw it was a spike where 20% were changing. That was right around the time where the EU was reopening, but it had been announced that the U.S. Would not, was not part of that uh, deal. So um, let's take a look at the next uh, slide here. Uh, every week, as you know, we ask folks about three key factors that would impact their decision to travel in the next six months. Uh, transportation and the economy concerns uh, continue to be pretty low, and no surprise, fear of coronavirus uh, uh, is, is, is the big dog in that fight in there. Now, the good thing about the trending is we can see that despite all the news and the kind of the setback of the surging uh, pandemic, especially in a lot of uh, uh, resort area uh, destinations that, uh, that, that that opened really quickly back in uh, late May, early June, uh, and so forth. We have still seen this volume of uh, of indicating uh, coronavirus will greatly impact your decision to travel, of uh, hovering around that low, upper 40s to low 50s 
uh, mark there. So it's showing, it's reinforcing this whole theory that the consumer mindset set was changing in terms of waiting out the pandemic to uh, being able to, to figure out how to travel within the confines, uh, constraints of the pandemic. Uh, so that, so that, so again, cautiously optimistic uh, that that didn't didn't spike heavily when we saw the surge uh, um, numbers spiking. Looking at the next uh, slide here, the economic concerns historically have been very low throughout this pandemic. In fact, this week's data you can see is the lowest uh, uh, lowest percentage showing concern, great concern uh, since the beginning of the survey. Um, again, a lot of folks have downsized their travel, right? Uh, they are they are maybe driving instead of flying. They are uh, maybe uh, doing le uh, less expensive accommodations or going, seeking out the great outdoors experiences. So they're camping or doing an RV uh, ex experience. Uh, and the gas prices are are, are are very low still. And then also we've got um, simple fact that a lot of people didn't spend. Uh, these are American travelers. They had some travel money. They haven't really spent that. Uh, so again, reinforcing it's, it's that big bubble of pent up demand. It's not about um, about if I'm going to travel or not, it's about how do I travel given the current conditions. And then to the next uh, slide here, we will see that the $64,000 question we always ask is very simply, are you going to travel in the next six months? And you can see historically, no matter how bad it's gotten so far, um, that number has never gone below two thirds of the American traveling public. So again, big ball of pent up demand. You've all heard me say this before, kind of running into that wall of fear, but guess what? People are starting to figure out how to go over or around the wall of fear. Um, not in the volume we want yet, but it's getting, but, 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 uh, but uh, all is not lost. Let's look at the next thing. Seriously, let's talk about when we ask these folks as travelers about a few questions as residents of their own communities. We want to gauge uh, their support for opening up their community to visitors. We want to gauge how they feel about just traveling outside of their own community. And and of course, uh, you know, the safety of dining and, and shopping in your own community. We remain a very divided country, um, quite frankly. And there you can kind of see how it how it splits uh, pretty uh, pretty much across uh, three different distinct camps there. And when we look at them individually. You can see historically uh, that supporting uh, opening up community visitations. You know, since the surge, we've gone down a little bit, um, and and, uh, and and obviously that is very con that's one of the more concerning statistics for us because uh, these are travelers telling us they still don't feel comfortable with visitors uh, into their community. So we've got a uh, you know that inward pivot that a lot of marketers have done, uh, a lot of destinations have done to help get their residents moving. The community is so essential because if they dip their toe in the water, they will feel more comfortable. So again, when we look at this, uh, again, feeling safe outside their community, uh, this again, reinforces a little bit of an uptick from the last survey uh, to this one, uh, reinforcing that people are just trying to figure it all out and decide for themselves, you know, what, what's that level of risk they're willing to accept. And it's on a personal, very personal individual uh, basis. And then uh, we asked a question this past week, that we've asked twice before in this survey. And uh, we were asking these travelers, what information or cues are you looking for to tell you that it is safe for you to plan and go ahead and take your trip there? And uh, not surprisingly, it's the official advice from the CDC or other federal government health experts. They want to see, hear from Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, et cetera. Um, and, that, that, and they find that the most, uh, uh, the most reassuring. Uh, and then, you know, you've got, it kind of goes down from there from a state, uh, the state and local elected uh, officials, appointed health officials, et cetera, um, there. We'll go all the way down, uh, only 17% advice from the White House Coronavirus Task Force, 14% uh, deals and offers from tourism industry promoting travel in the next month or two. That's such a low number, folks. Keep that in mind. You cannot discount your way into recovery. Yes, there's a small group that has been, uh, you know, that, that is looking for deals and so forth, and everybody's always wanting a deal right now. But, 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 but that's that will drive you a little bit incremental bit, uh, revenue, maybe, but it's not going to get you towards recovery, and that rate will take forever to get back uh, there. And of course, you know, it doesn't matter if Disney World's reopening is what the travelers telling us. Um, let's go to the next slide here, and we can see. Uh, when we overlay this question versus the two previous times we asked, this is our biggest headline today. Folks, American travelers are frustrated. They are losing confidence because all this back and forth uh, between, uh, you know, you, you've all been seeing it, hearing it in the news and how it's playing out, back and forth uh, between 
federal and state officials, uh, elected officials versus health officials and so forth. Uh, you know, do we wear masks? Don't we wear masks? Do we uh, send kids to school? Don't we send kids to school? Regardless of where you fall on the issue, it doesn't matter. The bottom line is for American travelers, it is uh, a, frustra it is a point of frustration. And you can see that, they, that, that there's been significant drop off uh, in confidence uh, here over the last couple months as, as we've been asking the questions. It's been getting worse and worse uh, there. So, uh, wrapping things up, uh, you know, we also looked at, you know, when we overlay this with some other health and safety uh, questions that we've had before, this is one that we did last month about the health and safety factors that are important to travelers for considering activities. So they lost confidence, but they still want to see, they still want to know what the plan is. So the destinations don't give up. It's so important, uh, destinations, accommodations, attractions, tell the guests what to expect when they arrive. If they want to know, they want to understand that. Um, and, 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 you know, they want to see you wear masks. They want to see you doing everything, uh, 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 best practices, mitigating risk, and, and they want to clearly communicate it. So if there's not all that confusion, keep your communication clear. And again, in case you missed this two weeks ago, we revealed this one. Uh, the American public, almost 60%, want to uh, will prefer a destination that has some type of mask ordinance in place. 35% will only visit destinations that require the use of masks in public. 9% will uh, lean against it, but only 3% will absolutely not visit a destination that required the use of masks in public. That's a lot of information in a very short time period. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn this back over to Chris and uh, you can find everything else uh, you wanna find on this topic to uh, on our website or on the Miles uh, uh, Communication Center. Thank you so much, Jamia. Um, and yes, please take advantage of those resources as a two page summary, plus um, the individual slide deck uh, available at that site, plus all the past editions. Uh, I've summarized the research and um, a range of other sort of critical best practices around recovery, particularly in terms of health and safety in this blog, um, which is tied to a two-part blog about uh, essentials for reopening and the recovery of tourism. And one of the key messages uh, that we've seen um, some research done by uh, another partner organization, Arrival. This was highlighted at uh, Destinations International. Only one in five attraction and activity and tour companies indicated that they've received guidelines and support from DMOs on reopening. And there was a significant amount of um, feedback from those companies that they're looking for that direction. So a critical area for DMOs to provide more clarity um, and you've seen from Amir the critical uh, issues around mask wearing, having clear, consistent health, safety, hygiene, cleaning standards, et cetera, in your organization. Uh, but let's pick up this theme of uh, the outlook for the balance of the summer, indeed the balance of the year. We're gonna ask a poll now. So for your own destination, what is the outlook for uh, travel through the balance of 2020? So you've got five options here. Is it equal or higher? Do you anticipate in terms of visitor arrivals and spending versus the same period 2019? Do you think it's gonna be down uh, one to 30%, down 30 to 60%, down 60% or more, or frankly, you just don't know it all. So I'll be asking Amir for his opinion in a moment. If he had to pick what are these answers, given um, his crystal ball uh, that the research provides. Um, in fact, Amir, why don't you jump in now and, and uh, provide some feedback? Which, which would you choose out of these options for the United States as a whole? Yeah, I think uh, for for uh, 2020 for the fourth quarter, uh, I think somewhere between the 31% to 60%. Uh, this uh, based primarily on the fact that meetings and groups are still a challenge, obviously uh, almost non-existent right now in terms of also business travel uh, being strongly curtailed. A lot of companies still, a lot of corporate travel managers not eager to send their folks on the road non-essentially. Uh, um, because you know, until there's some type of treatment or vaccine, so that 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 is still uh, that that that's going to be kind of the anchor that weighs us down a little, uh, quite quite a bit uh, 
from that perspective. You know, leisure travel incrementally, incrementally will continue to build uh, there. And uh, especially that regional drive market, obviously, is going to be kind of the saving grace, the silver lining and all of this. So that, that that's what we're looking Yeah. Okay, well, let's uh, bring up the results. So you can see, um, obviously, we've got a lot of budding research experts out there, Amir. They agree with you in terms of the majority. Oh. Slight majority yeah. below 31 to 60 percent. Uh, the next largest is a little bit more pessimistic, 60 percent or more, followed by uh, 1 to 30 percent. Yeah, uh, Delta Airlines announced this morning that they were down 72 percent. Uh, since March, and I think those sectors such as business travel, conventions, meetings, uh, major events, even sports-related travel, we're obviously seeing uh, you know empty stadiums. All of those are going to be down significantly more than um, you know the 30 to 60 percent. So they're going to be the, the last parts to uh, come back. Okay. So thank you so much, Amir. Um, Please um, hold on for uh, any questions. And again, a reminder to everybody, a couple of people are asking about the uh, research. Please visit, visit our COVID-19 site for uh, the research. So let me um, bring in John Lambeth. Hello, John. Um, and, Hi, Chris. Uh, it's great to be with you. Yes, it's it's been wonderful working with you and the whole team at Civitas Advisors, um, and of course the team of Adam Sachs, Jeff, uh, and everyone at Tourism Economics. Why don't you kick off and uh, give a quick update to what's happening with the Funding Futures Study, some of the key insights, and what's next? Thank you so much, Chris, and it's a really a pleasure to be with you today. It's great to be sort of sandwiched in between here, between Amir. Uh, and Mark, uh, they both have such uh, great information to share. We're, we're we're happy to be here sharing what we can about funding opportunities for DMOs that we're seeing out there. And this is a study uh, that we're working on. And I want to say special thank you to our our partners uh, at at Miles Partnership and of course Tourism Economics. I also want to say thank you uh, to U.S. Travel for helping sponsor this effort, as well as the Destination Marketing Association of Canada. Uh, the reason I think this is so exciting is that we have an opportunity. Collectively, we have an opportunity right now, a political opportunity, because our federal, state, and local officials know that our industry has been decimated. And you don't have to look any further than that last poll results or the information Amir shared to know that the industry has suffered greatly uh, from this terrible disaster they want to help us, and especially if our requests are not about more funding. Of course, we're all doing that. We're looking for ways uh, to get money out of the governments, and we're going to be talking about those in just a second. But where we've got chances to change policy, uh, they are more willing than ever right now to give that to us. And we need to take advantage of it as an industry and find policies out there. Yes, ask for the funding. Yes, get our fair share but also look for policy changes that will help us build back better uh, after the crisis. And this study is all about giving folks choices and letting them know of opportunities that are out there. So uh, my hope is we're not just putting this study on the shelf, we're doing it so that DMOs have some actionable items uh, that they can move on and actually make a difference uh, in the long run for their destination. Um, boy, we, we started out small, didn't we, Chris? We had, uh, well, originally we were going to do a very large study, uh, COVID hit. We said, well, we got to really scale this back. Uh, most of this is pro bono. Uh, it's grown and grown as we've seen other things that we wanted to, to add and things that we thought would be helpful to the industry. We've done a, a, a whole round of surveys. We've still got surveys out in the field. We've done focus groups uh, with DMO uh, leaders. We've done desk research on tax rates, on a state travel office funding. We we pulled in information from Europe. We partnered with the Now Group, and uh, we've got some good European information in addition to our Canadian uh, partner information. And finally, of course, the economic forecasting that Tourism Economics is working on. Uh, we all get forecasts. You all have seen a lot of forecasts. These are going to be the latest and greatest, and specifically are going to relate back to budgets. So I think you're going to find those forecasts uh, very interesting and very helpful. This slide shows the timing, uh, and we're well underway. In fact, we're getting ready to uh, release a discussion document tomorrow. 
that will be our first uh, foray into this. It's going to give you some uh, interesting first information about what we found and what we're offering. We are soliciting comments back. And then we will have uh, the final report out by August 20th. And we actually are doing a webinar with US Travel on August 20th to uh, present our results. But today we wanted to give your viewers a little sneak peek. We wanted to give them a little bit of information to share of some of the things that we're finding. And if you remember two years ago, our firm worked with US Travel and did a study on all the hotel tax rates, all the fees and charges on hotels all in uh, across the country. We looked at 100 destination. This study updates that. So we actually, for the first time, we're able to use a benchmark and look at what's happening to those rates. No surprises. 24% uh, of the destinations actually had an increase. We saw the average go from 14.6 to 14.9% uh, across the country as an average. And for larger cities, it shot up even more, went from 15.4 to 15.9% on average across the country. We're gonna have a lot more information in the study itself and pack it with analysis, like you see at the bottom here of the various regions and how they compete but hopefully it will give folks a lot of really good information about their comp set. How are others doing it? What are they charging in other places? And how does that reflect on our destination? Um, I mentioned the discussion document that is coming out tomorrow. Uh, we are gonna be posting that so folks can uh, take a read, take a look at uh, where this study is going and have a chance to give us uh, some uh, critical feedback. So this slide really shows you the heart of what we're doing. Uh, really talking about 10 funding opportunities for DMOs. And you can see we've broken that into three categories. Uh, first, response, second, resilience, and third, regeneration. Uh, so what I wanted to share with everybody today, I just, I'm gonna talk for just a brief minute about response and some of the emergency funding uh, that we're looking at and talking to folks about. Uh, talk a little bit about resilience, then I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Chris to talk a little bit about uh, regeneration. But you can see within each one of these categories, we're talking about concepts, some that have been out there, some that are novel, some that are being applied in different ways. And it will give all of you, hopefully, some really good ideas about what can you do with your funding? What are the options that are out there? And what can you take advantage of right now as we're dealing with this crisis? So on the emergency funding front, these are things I'm sure most of you are familiar with the idle loans the eda grants there are a lot of dmos still working their way through the eda grants they are not easy uh, but i suspect we will see several folks uh, come out successful on the eda grants it's worth noting that u.s travel has a bill in uh, 10 billion dollars of funding essentially for dmos through an eda grant process so the more you know about eda grants the more you're connected with eda you sign up, you get registered with grants.gov, grants and all of those items, you'll be a, a, get a running start uh, for what we think is coming in the future. I know many DMOs right now are out there uh, fighting for the coronavirus relief funds. These were monies given to the state and local governments uh, that they can, they have uh, discretion in terms of how those funds get allocated. And we're working with uh, several destinations right now that are fighting for those funds and to get those uh, discretionary grants of money. And of course, I think if you if you don't know, Congress is talking about extending PPPs to 501 C6s. You haven't been on a US travel webinar uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, it looks very promising uh, that that will get extended. Our message to all of you is get ready early. Uh, there's a lot to do to compile your records and get things together. We're putting in this report some of the things that you need to compile so that when that application process opens, you're at the front of the line. Second, <clears throat> boy, we have talked to so many folks about building reserves and it runs the gamut. I'll tell you, some folks aren't allowed to have any reserves, some DMOs, right? The government says, if you have any money left at the end of the year, you turn it back into the government. Uh, and on the end, other end of the spectrum, we've talked to DMOs that have over a year's worth of their expenses uh, in a reserve account. And if you have a shortage of reserves, now is the time to change that policy. And if you need government approval, there is no better time than now to be asking for government approval to change those reserve policies. We know cash is tight. We know that resources are down. It's <clears throat> gonna take a long time to build reserves. 
But if you need to change the reserve policy, now's the time to do it. Do want to give a shout out to my friend Kevin Kane in Memphis, who's always been a big believer in reserves. Uh, in addition, he formed a tourism improvement district to boost his budget. It allowed him to boost his re reserves significantly, and he has uh, done a great job of really having significant reserves for uh, what is a, a very, very difficult uh, time. And uh, so you. with this, I, I want to turn it back to you, Chris. Thanks a lot, John. Um, and uh, just a couple of other sort of areas we've highlighted in what is a pretty comprehensive look at those 10 options and opportunities. The whole issue of uh, shared risk. Um, we've been doing um, some research. I want to give a shout out to destination analysts who helped us with the survey of all the DMOs. They also were involved in a big meeting study of meeting professionals and event planners. And that highlighted a critical issue around the return of major events and conferences. There's a significant uh, belief from those professionals that uh, risk, risk around a recurrence of uh, the pandemic, even once we're on top of it, um, that it's changed the landscape and risk, and we're gonna need some uh, more creative approaches to public-private insurance that can mitigate that risk. And we're gonna be sharing in the discussion document a range of examples from around the world of pooled public-private insurance policies. Um, Visit Florida's had uh, a program in place for, I think, close to 15 plus years, uh, which covers the hurricane season. So there's some models here in the States we can build on. And then finally, just in terms of uh, uh, the whole area of regenerative uh, funding, uh, we've really highlighted the opportunity to have a look at some of these taxation and fee mechanisms and apply something that is fundamental to market economics in travel, which is yield pricing. So we want to incentivize certain types of travel and disincentivize others. So um, really, we're going to be uh, amplifying the opportunity to looking at different pricing mechanisms, more responsive pricing mechanisms that can hopefully not just generate revenue, but also uh, drive other outcomes that we want. Um, so a reminder, August 20th, we're gonna be issuing the full report. Uh, there's gonna be a webinar with the Destination Council of US Travel that is now available on our website to register. We'll be promoting that and we look forward to your attendance. A couple of DMOs uh, from cities and states will be joining us to talk about the implications and outcomes and next steps from the study as well. So um, thank you very much. And thank you, John, so much for your participation. Thank you, Chris. Okay, and let me bring in Mark now. Um, so uh, has the storm abated, mate? <laughs> I think so, just just about, but I do apologize in advance. If there's any crazy noise, it isn't me, it isn't my stomach. But I would I just want to concentrate on all the lovely places we're going and pretend it isn't a summer storm. <laughs> Very good. So Mark's uh, his lifetime really uh, career looking at travel uh, and specific luxury travel. And why don't we kick it off, yeah. Mark, with uh, we're gonna have a conversation, chat through some of the things you're seeing in luxury travel around the world. Sure. And mean for destinations who are with us today. Why yeah, and I was going to say, I was really, it was interesting to hear from Amir that for, only 14% of people are going to be incentivized to travel by, by price cutting, because I'm coming at this from a very different perspective. I spend my life kind of being rich adjacent, so I look at the 1%, <laughs> and I think even if a DMO's main audience isn't the 1%, there's a lot to be drawn from how they are traveling i love this look how they are traveling a little little private jet because the the elite this particular echelon is traveling in ways that it is legally able to much more than the mass market so i think you can extrapolate some stuff and again so just let's take a look at that jet the private jet this is the summer for my audience of jets and yachts now jets are really interesting the cares act made it cheaper than ever to travel by private jets. The taxes on planes were reduced through the end of the year. So not only uh, is, did, was it trying to support commercial aviation, but private aviation has been made more affordable and certain destinations have made themselves open only to jet travel. So the Bahamas is available to Americans who arrive on a yacht or on a jet, but not a commercial airliner. Seychelles, same thing. You can go there on a jet. 
What it's about is about managing capacity. They'd rather have fewer people spending more than a mass sort of nascent over tourism. And I think that's a really good reminder. Those price conscious people, not a big group, go for the less price conscious people. So, can um, I take you? We, yeah, so John, I was seeing, going, uh, yeah. What are we seeing in terms of um, how how are these island destinations handling testing and border controls? What what are some creative Funny solutions you know, there? Should we go on to Tahiti? Should we do a lovely picture of Tahiti? I think we've got a picture of Tahiti next. If um, I'm not controlling the presentation, but just imagine we're in Tahiti. Um, oh, that's Seychelles, but we'll go to Tahiti. Uh, Tahiti is a very interesting case study for anyone thinking about how to control testing. Island nations obviously have a jump on that because their borders are very highly defined and many island nations had quite low incidences of COVID-19 at sort of the height of the, pan the first flush of the pandemic. Tahiti has reopened to tourists. It used to be a long time, long haul kind of place. You would plan ahead. If you talk to travel specialists right now, they're finding people are booking Tahiti two weeks out. But what Tahiti has done is it has said there are two stages in testing. It's doing a PCR test. You have to have a 72 hour ahead PCR negative test, which many destinations are starting to require now. But Tahiti has also brought in a test that's handed to you on arrival. So four days in, you're asked to sort of spit in the cup, I think it is sputum, and you turn it in a designated testing center. And there is a sort of backup test to make sure everything is okay. And I think integrating testing and leaning into testing rather than pretending it's sort of something that's nothing to do with the destination is really, really smart. There are some startups like the COVID consultants. I spoke to them recently. There's some doctors who say, look, we know America's centralized testing is kind of terrible. It's slapdash, it's hiccupy for lots of reasons. Many destinations require this PCR test within 72 hours. The government run tests cannot guarantee that. For 200 bucks or so, spit in this cup, we will make sure you don't miss your vacation. They've already sold 2,000 uh, of those tests. They're performing more and more. And I think destinations that integrate that kind of thing into their marketing and say, we will help you get dependably tested, that removes a barrier for a traveler because there's a, there's a lot of intimidation about fulfilling those requirements. Not just that they're there, it's sure, but what happens if I can't get that test in time? And I think you have to lean into that. The other thing you wanna lean into, if we go onto the next slide, is what is what we're calling bubble charters. They're a new thing which integrate based on a true story, is a very, very high-end travel specialty company. It creates fairy tales for 1% families, like an odyssey through the Greek islands where you meet Zeus. It has partnered with a fractional jet firm to do that in Iceland. And essentially, you travel, it's all handled, you travel in a bubble. In a, you travel in a private jet, you land, the staff is still the same from end to end. You've seen that domestically, Dunton Hot Springs in Colorado has done that with ExoJet. VistaJet is doing it with yachts. It's about packaging. It's basically a high-end package holiday, which in Europe is very popular, but it's that sense of, let us show you how to get here. We won't leave it up to you. And I think, again, a lot of this is not about, you heard from the other two gents, a lot of this is not about unwillingness to travel. People want to find solutions, but they want to be reassured and they don't want to be overwhelmed. And the 1% basically says, I want it all bundled together, sell it to me at once. Very good. So obviously there's a tremendous opportunity, isn't there, Mark, to look at these okay. experiences and also these testing regimes and learn from their experience, whether it's at a national level or even in, in your own community uh, creating solutions that are based on examples from around the world that are working. Exactly. And I think if you look even domestically, you know, I live in New York, which is one of the most sort of domestically xenophobic states at the moment, the quarantine requirements, whatever. Um, as we start to work out how the country will function, I think you could see things like domestic requirements for PCR tests. And if you have 
pre-imagined that with people like the COVID consultants, it does just take one little barrier away. What yeah. I would love to do is I would love to give people some inspiration as well from what I've seen some luxury destinations do that maybe DMOs can talk to some of their members. They can kind of help people see ways to operate successfully within this. And if we go on to the next slide, we can just look at the Lodge of Blue Sky, which is this amazing luxury resort. Ah, oh, Great American Driving Trip. They're fully aware. A lot of drive-ins now. Lodge of Blue Sky, which is a, an auberge property, has done something which I think is very, very borrowable. It has recognized that service in rooms is one of those touch points people are afraid of. They're a little intimidated with too much human interaction. So they've done two things. They're putting a whole load more towels in your bathroom so that you don't necessarily have to have service every morning. It's literally as simple as that. But they're also turning turn down rather than it being an interaction. There's a beautiful door hanger with some extra bath gel, shampoo, and then a little punnet of strawberries from the Lodge of Blue Sky's own farm. It's a charming, thoughtful gesture, which is personalized, but not interpersonal. I think that's a, a big, big thing. You're also seeing Auberge is doing some very interesting stuff around how to package food, picnic kits, barbecue kits. Neil Jacobs, who runs Six Senses, is one of my favorite luxury hoteliers. He said, luck, everyone wants their food coming to them covered, but no one wants it covered in saran wrap. That doesn't feel very indulgent. He said, I think we'll see bento boxes and tiffins, that lovely, gorgeous packaging that nonetheless has a lid on it. So your food has a lid. I think we'll also, I think we'll also see, we're all gonna live in a little bit of Downton Abbey. Aquilina in Florida has bubble staffing. So when you check in, you're essentially assigned a certain group of staffers who will attend to your needs. They'll book the lounger reservations, they'll clean your room. So again, it's about lessening the number of people you encounter. Um, I don't think anyone is going to do what Mustique did, which was basically charter its own airline for the summer, where it was running flights from New York to London. But I think it's an interesting lesson. If you have key markets that are really, really fundamental to you, as New York and London are to Mustique, working out how to make transit from even those couple of markets really much easier could be fundamentally impactful. I would also say, I'm sure everyone saw Barbados has this new visa that Bermuda has copied, good for them. The 12 month work from here visas. They're saying, you know what? You're gonna do your white collar job remotely. Why don't you bring your expenditure down to Barbados? You're not gonna take a job away from a local, but you're gonna keep people employed by spending in the restaurants. Oh, and by the way, our COVID incidence is incredibly low. And I think encouraging people, not necessarily to think of places that would have been vacation destinations as vacation places, but as extended stay options. I think a premium traveler has that money to spend. I, I, I've had one, I had one, uh, I had one jeweler say to me, we're living in, the, in a period of the Corona bonus because wealthy people didn't take all the trips they planned and they have a pot of money they don't know what to do with. I'm selling them rings, other people are selling them real estate. And I think that extended stay, maybe domestically, is a way to siphon that money back into travel. Very good. I think you've got another couple of examples, um, Mark, in terms of some of the adaptation you're seeing in terms Absolutely. of luxury pivoting and also that whole shift from international travel to maybe domestic. So let's get out the next slide. Exactly. So Uncover, Jason Wirtz, who runs Uncover, is an amazing operator, but he works usually in Europe, <laughs> taking Americans on very customized, personalized trips. But he's based in California. What did he do very quickly? He pivoted and said, I'm going to run my kind of trip in Santa Cruz, around that, in the wine countries of California instead of Tuscany. Same thing if you look at Mango Safaris, they usually operate in Africa, showing people the big five. This year, and I think we've got a lovely slide, exactly, we're going west, a stateside safari. They're going to be in Yellowstone and in New Mexico. And I think you might find there are operators who 
take Americans around the world who will be looking to work with you to find ways to provide their kind of experience in state or domestically. I mean, remember, there's, you know, it's very, very important if you look at data. If you get rid of outbound, inbound travel as a difference and just all travel is domestic, three nations are net winners. China is straight ahead, and then the UK and Germany, all of the sort of British and Germans who go for sort of sun in the Mediterranean who can't go, that helps their domestic operation. Two other nations are way behind, and that's the US and Spain, because they have a lot of inbound. But that doesn't mean you don't have domestic travelers who want to replicate something they can't do overseas right here. And I love the idea of going horseback riding around Yellowstone, looking at the moose, looking at the wild animals there. No, it's not rhinos, but it's an incredible memory. So I would encourage people to think about operators who wouldn't necessarily operate domestically, who will also be looking for, to be adaptable. So you've got any final advice, Mark, for destinations in terms of working with their high-end yeah. accommodation or experiences in this um, you know, period of crisis? I think buyouts are very important. Um, I'm sure everyone will have seen that in their in their region. Cape Arundel Inn in Maine is is only available at buyouts, I believe, July and August. A friend of mine runs a gorgeous masseria called Prapana in Puglia, and you know masseria have have walls around them from the marauding raids that they once had from the Ottoman Empire. He's operating that as a buyout only, and I think thinking of smaller properties as being sold to groups who self-select, super, super helpful. I think Tahiti's leaning into testing and making it really straightforward and saying, we'll tell you how to do this. Try the COVID consultant, we'll provide these tests, really helps people feel reassured psychologically, logistically. And I do, as I say, I think that 12 month work from Barbados for Muda Visa has a lot of transferability almost anywhere. If you're looking at certain properties, some companies that have now said, we don't expect workers back by obligation until summer 2021, the well-to-do traveler thinks, I do have disposable income. Maybe I'll rent a house somewhere new. And I think looking at tourism in that way as well, broadening out, gives you a new potential market. Not, a, not as big as a mass over tourism market, but definitely, again, remember, we look, we're realizing the travelers are not being driven by promotions, they're being driven by options, reassurance, convenience, inspiration. Very good. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, why don't we bring up the other, uh, Amir and uh, John. And uh, we've got a couple of questions. I'll just come to those in a moment. Uh, just before that, some final resources. Um, so um, we've got um, a number of uh, resources in terms of um, available on our COVID-19 site. Uh, that includes a summary of the um, information from um, uh, Global All Stars, um, as well as the recording from today, slide decks, uh, all of the previous webinars, plus webinars from our partners. So let's go to uh, a question uh, from Fiona. So she's asking, uh, there's so many things to focus on, there's so many uh, issues to deal with in this crisis. What is the one thing that you think I should focus on today and tomorrow? So why don't we kick it off with you, Mark, and then I'll come to John and Amir. <laughs> I, I think I've already said that. I, I would encourage people to remember that both logistically and financially, you're better off having 10 travelers who spend $10,000 each than, do the quick math, whatever the equivalent is of 100 travelers spending $1,000 each, especially at the moment when you're going to have to be distanced. Emphasize your premium, you're, you're going to find that easier. And those travelers also find it easier to get to you because they may well charge for a jet. Okay. John, what would you advise Fiona? Uh, well, I think what I would say is look toward recovery, right? We are all mired in this crisis today. Uh, there are There's so much to deal with, and I know it's so difficult. DMO leaders are struggling with, you know, who are they having to lay off? Who are they bringing back? And when are they doing it? And all of those kinds of things are day-to-day. -day. 
and they're gut-wrenching and they're difficult, but tr try to find a little bit of time in your day to think about six months or a year from now. And what can you be doing now to put yourself in a better position then? Because there are a lot of opportunities. Our specialty is funding. We know there are opportunities for folks now to improve their situation in the future, but I think that applies to all the various aspects that a DMO leader has to think about. Okay, and then Amia. Yeah, I, I agree with my esteemed colleagues here. Uh, you know, don't let a good crisis go to waste, right? Use this opportunity to try something different, to to you know find the low hanging fruit and 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 go after it, even if it means you know revamping your business model. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's uh, as John said. You know, look look towards recovery. Recovery will happen. It's going to happen differently for a lot of different people, a lot of different segments, but it will happen. So so uh, find 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 your one thread and 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 go after it. Okay, Stu. Just a final question for each of you to comment on. Stu's asking a question that we actually uh, was at the center of our Global All Stars presentation, which is what is the one thing that you could nominate that you think is gonna be changed forever by 2020, whether it's the pandemic or uh, other social issues going on, what's gonna look completely different in travel in 2021 and beyond that's gonna be changed permanently? So, Mark? Um, I think I think um, we, we, we uh, Chris and I were talking last year about over tourism. And I don't think anyone realized that there was a very simple solution to over-tourism, but one that must be so quite so awful. And I think over-tourism as a, as a nagging problem for the travel industry is not going to be something that is top of mind for quite some time. And I think that gives people breathing room to do exactly what they need to do, which is think about how to cope with it. I think people were running from behind going, what do I do, what do I do? Now you have that breathing room, but but I don't think enormous volumes of people clustered together. I think there's lots of reasons that won't be an imminent problem. Very good, John. Well, Chris, I was just glad to hear from Mark that the price of private jet travel is down now. So hopefully we can all <laughs> take advantage of that. I'll split it with you. Right? Like, I'll split it with you. 120 grand to Tahiti one way. I'll split it with you. Right, right now in the near term. That, that won't be permanent, right? That's gonna change back. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, certainly um, this age of video calls, video conferencing, I think will uh, continue to some extent. Meetings can't be replaced. Face-to-face -face meetings will come back and I think they will come back strong, but there will be a segment of our market that will continue to do things through video conferencing that didn't before. And so that's one thing to think about, plan for, and recognize that that will be a change to the industry. Okay, and then Amir, why don't you wrap it up? I think the consumer expectations for safety and cleanliness protocols is going to linger with us uh, beyond pandemic. You know, all these protocols won't stay, but masks and you know, and and, and, and the interest in how how a hotel is cleaning my room, how the airline is accommodating me to make me to keep me safe, uh, the processes that destinations are going through. That there's going to be a lot increased awareness uh of that and, and and there's going to be new new points of entry uh to to, to get in the, in the consideration set down the down the funnel to purchase uh, with that so that that's not going to go away that's going to that's going to be part of us do you know amir i was going to say one thing i would add to that it's fascinating someone said to me after 9 11 there was something called the theater of security where suddenly airports were foregrounding all their attempts to make sure they felt as safe as possible and he said i think we're going to see a theater of wellness which won't necessarily be about more cleanliness but suddenly lobbies won't be cleaned at 3 a.m they'll be cleaned at 3 p.m during check-in because that will be a tacit reassurance to people so back of house will become a real front sort of front and center operation and that will help these people and so that theater of wellness i agree with you a thousand percent Yes, and, and in fact, wellness was already a sort of trend, uh, an area of growth, wasn't it, even prior to this COVID-19. I think the, the, you know, the pent-up demand we're seeing in the research shows that this desire to travel and discover and to explore new places remains just baked into our DNA. Um, 
but I agree uh, with all of you that there's an opportunity to build back better and hopefully make a tourism industry that's much more inclusive. And, and something I've been advocating hugely is connecting with your local residents. It's so important today during the reopening and restart. And we're seeing in the research that we've still got a lot of work to do in terms of getting locals out and about in our own community. Us feeling comfortable welcoming visitors. So. Um, just uh, let's just flick on to the last couple of slides just to show those resources I mentioned uh, previously. Um, you can see the uh, research graphs and summary information available um, from um, uh, Longwood on our Clarity in Time of Crisis website, plus a range of other insights, uh, and you can link through to the Global All Stars site. On that Global All Stars site, you'll see the uh, presentations that we had uh, from the Destinations International Annual Convention, reimagining the future of tourism. So you can see what um, our luminaries there said, uh, Rita and Todd, uh, State Tourism Directors from Virginia and Oregon, and Sina back by Papua Advan, talking about the way in which uh, TMO is gonna be changed forever. Uh, plus a range of other resources. So let me thank uh, again very much Amir, uh, John and Mark for joining us today. We greatly appreciate your time and effort and we greatly appreciate the audience who joined us today. We look forward to connecting with you again soon and hopefully in person. Have a great rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Bye.